not apt to crack and say steel? Um, I can't speak to the engineering. Um, what I can speak to is that when the tank arrives and is placed in the hole, um, the fire department will inspect, um, and then we do tightness testing uh, at that time, and then um, we tightness test all, uh, or witness all the testing of all the piping. Uh, and then when it's buried, we retest and test again after it's buried so that uh, as ground is compacted around it, to the extent that we would expect it to move, um, <coughs> we test again to make sure that nothing has moved. Um, once you get beyond that, I think you're talking possibly a cataclysmic event of some sort. Oh, and what? A cataclysmic event oh, is yeah. a shifting, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, earthquake shifting the soil. Right. You know, all bets are going to be off. Right. Ultimately, although you, you might be able to speak better to this, some tanks do move through events, through floods like that, and, and do not rupture, do not leak. Okay. Um, the other thing is, you said a leak was detected. Is that was that contained within the outer wall, or is there going to be contaminated soil? To no, was, that that leak was they found water mm -hmm. in the space between the two tanks, mm -hmm. uh, okay. the two so, walls of the tank. Okay, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. So, if you could speak kind of generally to the to the increase in capacity and and whether that would uh, represent a particular new safety threat or or not. I don't think it would re represent any more safety event than what's currently there. It increases the amount of product there. Um, there would probably be fewer deliveries. Correct. So you decrease the amount of, the real hazard is really driving the truck down the road and putting that, that product in the ground. So if you decrease the, uh, the, the number of times that that occurs over time, you're actually decreasing the possibility of some kind of incident when that product is moving from the truck to the, to the ground. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Hayden? Um, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, clearly, you know, this this seems like it's ginormous, and then and so there are kinds of concerns that we might have. Um, I'm very familiar with the, this double wall system, having installed a number of them over at my place of work. I don't know if you could briefly um, explain how it's built, so that, for instance, if the ground were to shift, that it has no impact at all on the inner tank because of the interstitial <coughs> space between them. Number one. Number two, how that space works to, you know, pick up monitoring and, and other you know, the problems with all the sensors on the bottom. Um, and third, check, 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 check. check. All right, it works. Uh, planning board replaces select check, board. Check, 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 check. check, check. It's, oh, but you, but you sit here. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you sat with this. Yeah, and I will. I'll give you basically you know, a, yeah. a five. I can give you a, an hour-long <laughs> yeah, dissertation on the safety equipment. But basically, these are to really simplify it: a double wall tank system. And what it is is exactly what it sounds like. It's a fiberglass tank wrapped by another fiberglass tank, and there is a space in between those two tanks. It's called the interstitial space. Hess prefers a hydrostatic interstitial space. And what that means is that there's a brine in between the two tanks. It's bright green, and when they set the tanks level into the ground, what they do is there's a reservoir on the top of the tank, and the brine is basically set. That doesn't change. And that's monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And what that does is if that brine level shifts in any way, whether it goes up or whether it goes down, those monitors are very sensitive. They will pick up the shift in the brine, which means a couple of different things. It can mean that you have a breach in the inner wall of the tank, and that can mean either brine from the interstitial space is making its way into the inner tank, or it could mean product that is in the tank, in the inner tank, is making its way into the interstitial space, which would make the brine rise. What we think happened at the tank today was that groundwater was making its way into the interstitial space. And the same thing would happen if that happened with the new tanks. The brine in the reservoir would rise because you'd have groundwater making its way in. Or if there was no groundwater present, the brine would leave the interstitial space and that reservoir would shrink. So that will basically detect any release of product or any breach in the inner or outer wall of the tank. You also have overfill 
prevention devices on the tanks basically set at 90% capacity and another one at 95. So gone are the days of your fuel delivery vehicle driver comes, hooks his hose up to the tank, he's dropping his product and he goes, he decides to have a conversation with the attendant and next thing you know you got product making its way out of the tank onto the ground and <clears throat> ultimately to wherever it goes. At 90%, what will end up happening is some valves inside the tank will start to shut off the ability for the driver to drop product into the tank. Alarms will begin to sound. There's an audio alarm, individual alarm at the area where they're fueling. You also have a 95% sensor on the tank so that basically what that'll do is whenever the driver is dropping product, they also have to take the vent or the vapors out of the tank back into the truck. At 95%, there's a valve that keeps the vapors from being able to be displaced from the tank. And obviously, you won't be able to put more product in if you can't get the vapor out. So there are fail-safes in place regular to being able to overfill the tank. You also have other devices, buckets on the ports where product is either being introduced to the tank or vents are being, or vapors are being taken out to help, again, any condensate that may be created will make its way back into the tank. <coughs> There are bells and whistles on the product piping so that if there's a breach in the product piping, basically that's the line going from the tank to the dispenser, the product will be shut off. You won't be able to get product from the tank to the dispensers. It'll first slow the distribution of product, but if there's a big enough breach, it'll shut it off completely. The dispensers are fit with protection devices so that Again, you've probably all seen in movies, somebody drives in and hits a dispenser, knocks it over, and you get product shooting out of the ground. You don't have that anymore. Uh, you have shear valves both on the dispenser and the island, so that in the event a dispenser is displaced, the piping is sheared off, and basically you get very little product that will make its way uh, into the environment. The hoses are fit with similar protection devices, so that in the event Someone happens to drive off with the hose, instead of getting a major release of product, all they get is a bill when they're picked up on the video camera. But uh, really, it's a state-of-the-art system. And uh, the chief or assistant chief's office will have an opportunity to review the entire set of plans. If we're approved, we have to submit uh, underground storage tank installation permits and removal permit applications with the fire department. And that's where we'll submit I think it's about an eight-page set of plans that outlines all the bells and whistles. And to your point, relative to a major event, if you had an earthquake, never been asked a question. I, I wouldn't vouch for anything if you had a shift uh, in the soils like that. These tanks are designed, they've got couplings and whatnot, they are designed to fluctuate a little bit. You know, there are, there's going to be some settling or you might get uh, you know, a little bit of lift in the tanks, but these things are set with dead men, which are basically concrete pile or pier, <coughs> for lack of a better term, laid on their side with straps that hold the tanks down. There's an eight inch concrete mat over the top of the entire tank field. So these things are designed with the intent that they are empty and set in water. So they're not gonna basically move once they're set. They're pretty much where they're gonna be. Again, maybe some microscopic movement, but nothing that should uh, result in an issue where we need to worry about the differences between steel and fiberglass. And fiberglass reinforced plastic <coughs> tanks, which are what are being installed here, is basically, again, the industry standard. And since 1994, I've probably, I would guess, designed and permitted probably well over 500 gas stations throughout New England. And that's pretty much what everybody's using, not only here, but across the country as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions, Mr. Hayden? Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe one. So we're increasing the capacity by 70%. Um, sure. That suggests to me that if a delivery can't be made, we have 70% more capacity to deliver uh, if the road should be closed for whatever reason. Uh, when you say the road should be closed, <laughs> yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I, and to further what the <clears throat> assistant chief said, that is one of the benefits of increasing capacity at the site is you are going to limit the amount of fuel deliveries on site. And every site's different, it's based on demand. Uh, but this is a fairly low demand station compared to others in the chain. And also as indicated, your biggest opportunity to have a problem is when the fuel delivery tank is on site dropping product. So reducing 
the amount of times that tanker is on site ultimately reduces the amount of times you can have a problem. Okay. Other questions or comments from select board? I would just note for the record that the application has been re reviewed uh, by both the fire department and the inspection uh, services department and recommended for approval. Thank you. All right, other questions or comments before we go to public other questions or comments? All right, anyone from the public like to comment on the application? All right, then. Mr. Eden. I'd move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, all in favor of closing the public hearing at 651, say aye. Aye. Aye, aye no, that's unanimous. All right, then, deliberation by select board. Very easy. Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve the application of Hess Corporation, Woodbridge, New Jersey, relative to the removal of three existing single-wall steel underground storage tanks, USTs, an installation of two new 20,000-gallon double-wall fiberglass underground storage tanks at their Hess Express gasoline facility located at 468 West Street, Amherst, MA, granting an amended fuel storage license increasing maximum capacity underground from 24,000 gallons to 40,000. Application presented by LMD Stefano from Bowler Engineering. Second. Further discussion. I would just note um, that uh, I, I appreciate very much the information that you gave tonight as well as all the information in the packet. I appreciate very much uh, Assistant Chief McKay attending and talking about safety issues with us. Um, Selfward us good questions. And, um, and the fact that this has been all reviewed previously by our inspections department and the fire department <coughs> is much appreciated and the recommendation is appreciated. I will note for folks at home that uh, a butter notices did go out to everyone in the neighborhood and uh, everyone required so, um, and no one did show up to express any concerns about this, nor did we receive comment <coughs> previously uh, via email or call to the select board office. So that's all I have to say. Other comments? All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And then we'll uh, leave those with you there. Terrific. Thank you very much. And what we got back. Appreciate it. Yes, <clears throat> I probably it's mentioned it at the beginning when I wasn't here, but it was incredibly helpful to have that information that uh, town, council. town staff asked town thank council. You. So yes. thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Yep. All right, so the other items on our agenda, just so select board notes, the um, housing study and summer meeting schedule were carried over from last meeting just in case we didn't get to them at that time because the agenda was posted prior to that, so we're done with that. We do have on our amended motion sheet, or rather our revised motion sheet, a couple of new uh, issues, a special license, as well as some committee appointments. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve the application of Deborah Snow on behalf of Blue Heron Restaurant and Catering, 112 North Main Street, Sunderland, MA, for a wine and malt special license for a rehearsal dinner to be held at Eric Hall Museum in Amherst, Saturday, May 12, 2012, from 6 to 9 p.m., Kendra Nielsen, event manager, contingent on approval of the Amherst Police yep. Department. We can actually strike the last part because okay. we have since received the approval of the okay. Police Department. So it's no longer contingent. Okay. Oh, is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. And we have appointments. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I move that the select board approve the appointments of Greg Stutzman and Aaron Blodgett to the Housing and Sheltering Committee for a term to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Eden. I just want to note that um, <clears throat> it's not unusual to have folks serve on committees who live out of town, as is the case here. That is a good point. Thank you very much. Ms. Brewer. And have resided, especially that have resided here in town um, previously. And I also just wanted to say that clearly people do occasionally listen to our meetings because both of these met the uh, criteria that we were looking for to fill those final two slots. Fantastic. Thank you to everyone who talked to everyone and who listened to our meetings. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right. 
uh, other issues. Um, the only other thing we have to do tonight is to have an executive session. So, um, and we are going to be meeting again Monday night. So, um, mm -hmm. I don't think we have any logistical issues related to town meeting currently. Um, uh, Mr. Musanti, actually, you want to give us an update on Article 29 and the status of that? Um, I have received from council a uh, draft version of uh, uh, modifying the petition as submitted uh, into a, a resolution form, and um, that is going out to the petitioners and expect to be getting good dialogue and feedback and, and be in a position to have something in your packet. Uh, before the weekend for your Monday meeting, where we hope you can take a position on this. Thank you. Um, other key information updates from town manager or select board? Probably nothing that can't wait until Monday. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to make sure, is this gentleman here for anything on the agenda that I'm not expecting? I'm very excuse me. Oh, you didn't oh, even need to come to this. <laughs> but thank you so much for, oh. for volunteering to be part of that. So, uh, we appreciate your service very much. All right. Anything else then before we adjourn to executive session? We have the motion. I'll make the motion. Um, the, I move to go into ex executive session per Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding the landfill solar project lawsuit as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of this public body. An open session will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Second. And by roll call vote, Mr. Wall. Aye. Stein, aye. Lateef, aye. Hayden, aye. Wald, aye. And thus, the open session of this meeting uh, <coughs> adjourns at 6.57 p.m. And we'll see folks again on Monday. Thank you.